What trip to Michigan would be complete without swinging by Monroe and Associates? Is that what it says? That's the wrong, uh, no, that's the right place. So I guess that means I'm here. And I even got to chat with them. Let's find out what that's all about. I'm Brian. Welcome to my Tesla weekend. You start tearing cars apart, pretty soon you know what goes into them. So I'm here with Corey. Corey Steuben from Monroe and Associates. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a quick chat about the Model S Plaid. It's a fast car. It's a performance beast. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Impossible. You couldn't do it. You couldn't copy it. Or could you? You could. You could. Let's walk over to it. Yeah, so when you think of a Model S Plaid, you think of a 1,040 horsepower beast. But in reality, they're just shoving three Model Y rear motors into one vehicle with carbon fiber wrap rotors. So I don't have the motors here, but in mm -hmm. the rear, you have motor one, motor two, and in the front, you have motor three. So mm -hmm. a typical Model Y or Model three would have an induction machine in the front instead of an internal permanent magnet. They're, they're putting three internal permanent magnet motors in this thing, and it's an aluminum body. So making aluminum bodies not something that is really groundbreaking because Audi in the mid 90s made the D3 platform, which was I think over 95% aluminum. And as different crash uh, requirements have been enacted by different regulatory bodies, now there's actually more steel in aluminum bodies. So this inside the A pillar, you'll have a, typically a boron or hot pressed steel. Uh, you can, I don't know, one of these layers. Um, for roof crush, and sometimes you also have other strengthening in the A pillar for small overlap rigid barrier. So you mentioned, like, if you wanted to make a thousand horsepower EV, you could essentially buy our report and decode what that is, the cost associated with it. It's not the same level of novel, uh, novel engineering needed. So think of like a Bugatti has a W16 engine with turbochargers and all this wild technology and a crazy transmission and crazy driveline and arrows to get that massive performance. With an EV, it's less sexy. It's pretty lame, actually, if you ask me. It's just more electric motors mm -hmm. and the same battery with a similar uh, amount of power, so. So it's, it's not rocket science. No. Now, if I am a legacy company and I want to and I want to build a plaid. I, I can have my engineers buy one, tear it down. I'm gonna spend what, three million of my own money? Mm, a couple million. A couple million between yeah. my engineers and all the tests and all that. Or, and really not or, but and or, I can buy a report. Yeah, so our reports, which you're asking about, um, they have the detailed cost analysis. Mm -hmm. So it'll allow you to understand what you'd have to spend to develop the powertrains to achieve that. And by powertrains, I mean the electric motors and the wiring and the cradle and the strength associated with that. Now we're talking about the Plaid, but we also have the same report for the Model Y from 2020, the Model Y from 2022. And you see a huge reduction in the number of fasteners um, huh from vehicle to vehicle. And what that means is it gets easier and easier to build. So look at the size of this front cast, the front casting and the rear casting. What that's doing, it's eliminating all these joining, these joining procedures, whether using SPRs, self-piercing rivets, or uh, structural adhesive, or these fasteners here and there, um, there and there. When you make the part uh, larger and larger, you're then eliminating all these opportunities for error. What are these? So these little dots are put on there uh, for when we do a 3D scan. Oh. So we scan with a scanner and these are targeting light, targeting spots. That's great. So they have high contrast there. That's great. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when we saw this as a two piece rather than a one piece, that was kind of surprising yeah. at the time. When people say two piece, it's actually a lot of pieces. You have one, two, then you have three, and then technically you got to count all the fasteners then you have four, five, Aren't the crush, six. Are the crush cans part of it now? They're integrated, yeah. Oh. So really this is a combination of, I think close to probably 20 to 30 parts because see that's all cast up there, this cross car portion. Oh yeah. This was a separate extrusion right here. Oh yeah, sure is. 
Sure and there's is. a lot of threaded fasteners. So I don't know the total part count, but I'd say 15 to 20 to one. Now I know when early on in the channel's history, there was uh, Sandy had expressed that there were a number of car manufacturers that weren't yet on board with getting Tesla reports. And when you and I talked last year in San Diego, you said that nowadays it feels like the, the market is larger than it was before for mm -hmm. these kinds of reports. Who's buying, for example, the Plaid report? Everybody? Mm -hmm. OEMs, mm -hmm. tier ones, tier twos. Tell us, the uh, tell us what a tier two is. So tier one is a company that supplies a part that ends up on the vehicle. So a tier one supplier would supply the headlight. Mm -hmm. A tier two would supply parts that make this assembly. So a tier two wow. could be the company that provides the pieces or small sub-assemblies sure. or fasteners that goes into here. The people they buy Tier from. three is even lower, wow. tier four. So the further, a tier three or four could be a raw material supplier. Right. So a, the company that provides the raw iron for this is, could be a tier three or four. It depends wow. on where it is in the process. Then there's the, com there's the company that casts the rotor and machines it and provides it to the, the integrator here, which is the tier one. So the rotor supplier could be a tier two mm -hmm. or it could be a tier one, depending on if you're supplying it <clears throat> to the OEM. So it really is how far you're removed from the OEM is tier one, two, and three. Then you have traditional tier one suppliers like Bosch, Magna, Borg Warner, Dana. These make all sorts of large complicated sub-assemblies. And then traditional tier twos would be someone that makes a small pump that goes into, or a fan motor that goes into an HVAC module. Gotcha. So you have typical tier ones and tier twos, but a tier two may be a tier one, and a tier one may be a tier two when you're actually talking about where they are in the supply chain. So in terms of buying plaid reports, it's OEMs, it's tier ones, it's tier twos. And it's the finance industry. The finance, and, yeah. fi and it's the startups. Yep. And it's companies from a, I'm going to, I'm just using ger generic words here because I assume you don't yeah. want to give me the secret sauce, but from all around the world. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, head on over here and see some of our Ford products. So we've got the Mustang Mach-E and the F-150 Lightning. Now, so the four, first EVs released by Ford are using more of the traditional build methodology. Mm -hmm. This is what you've seen from OEMs mm -hmm. uh, for the past really 30 to 40 years. Uh, complex uh, weldments mm -hmm. using stampings and different levels of, of steel to achieve the, the performance needed. Uh, and then lately we've seen more use of ultra high strength steel and high strength steel in the torque boxes, A pillars and B pillars to get the structure needed to pass these, these stringent tests that I mentioned. And those tests get harder almost every they year? They get harder every year. So if you notice the size of this, there's a test called the small, small overlap, overlap rigid barrier test, which engages 25% of the car, which would start about here. So oftentimes you'll see different shotguns coming out here to engage so that you have some structure here dissipating that energy. Because before, uh, many OEMs relied on just the rail structure for moderate overlap, which would hit 40% of the car. So you'd engage the rail and this would crush, but there would be very little structure on the outside here. So the reason why that's important is a lot of roads in the United States are two lane highways, one lane each way. And if you do a center line cross and barely hit, what happens is you have a huge amount of energy going over a small amount of area. So large energy, small area means that that energy is going to transfer into here and you had penetration into the uh, occupant compartment. Or if you had a weak A pillar, you'd even have A pillars folding. So the strength of the structure of the, of the tumble home, the occupant, essentially your occupant home, as well as your ability to dissipate uh, energy here is really important. Are you seeing manufacturers other than Tesla getting aggressive with their thermal management in things like octavalve situations. So yeah, let's go over here and talk about that. So you mentioned the word aggressive. <laughs> um, I'd use a different word, elegant. 
So when you're designing a system from scratch, you want to achieve the best possible performance with the least amount of cost, piping, effort, and money. Mm -hmm. And by effort, I mean effort assembly. So notice these lines. You have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. This is supplying your refrigerant for your air conditioning, and this is supplying your refrigerant for your heat. You have two separate condensers inside the HVAC module, and a condenser inside of an HVAC module is how it would generate heat to heat the passengers. It's backwards, because you think, why would you be using refrigerant to heat? Because typically you think of refrigerant as what you use to cool, refrigerant. Well, in a, in a heat pump cycle, you use the compressor to compress the R1234YF from a gaseous state to a very hot gaseous state. And then as you go through a condenser, you, when you pull that heat out, uh, typically the condenser's in the front of the vehicle where your fans are running. But if you pump that into the HVAC cabin, you can pull that heat out to heat the cabin. But when you pull that heat out, you actually precipitate from a, from a hot pressurized gaseous state to a vapor state or liquid state, depending on as the phase changes. And this is not novel, but heat pumps in cars are different than heat pumps for your home. A lot of people think, oh, I don't want a heat pump because then I have a high electricity bill and it's not that efficient. It's not as efficient as using you know, natural gas. Natural right. gas gets very hot very quick. Heat pumps work differently in automobiles where they're three times as efficient compared to using a PTC heater, which is a positive temperature coefficient heater, which is essentially taking electricity and heating up an element just like right. a stove yeah. and then running either ethylene glycol over that or having a PTC to air, which is what the original Tesla Model 3s had. The Model Ys were launched with this. So a lot of people talk about the octo valve, but it's not about the octo valve in how it moves the fluid. It really is the fact that you have your manifold for your refrigerant right next to your manifold for your coolant. Everything is as close together as possible. If you had these same elements, pump one, pump two, liquid cooled condenser, chiller, all of the valves, and then also the valving for the ethylene glycol, you could have these components as purchased off the shelf components from a tier one or tier two mounted throughout the vehicle. But if you have a pump over here and a valve over here, what do you have between it? A line. A long line. If you have line. a pump over here and a valve over here, how do you secure it to the vehicle? A bracket. So think about that. This thing becomes its own omni bracket. Essentially, when everything is bolted together, you need no bracket because it's all held together by itself. Yeah. This pump doesn't have a separate bracket. This pump doesn't have a separate bracket. This valve doesn't have a separate bracket because it's all bolted to this unit, which is then hung uh, from the cross car uh, strut, strut support on the Model Y, the Model 3, and the Model S Plaid. Now, this elegant solution probably costs them a lot of money in R&D. This is developing something that does not exist. You cannot reach out to a tier one and say, make me this in 2018 or 19, whenever it was developed. And if you go back a generation to the super bottle, this is what was on Tesla's before you had the heat pump system. So the super bottle still uses some of the same strategies, those same motors right here, the electric motors that run the pump, bolted onto the bottle, the valve was integrated into the bottle, and the chiller was bolted onto the side of the bottle. So even though this relied on a PTC heater to generate heat in the cabin, the quarterbacking the ethylene glycol through the system was still handled in a very elegant manner. And we were the first people to find this little Easter egg, mm -hmm. this little ketchup bottle with a, with a, uh, um, a cape on. Mm -hmm. And we sent this to uh, Jalopnik, uh -huh. And Jalopnik wrote an article in 2000 and early 2018. And uh, the photos were taken with my iPhone and I sent them to David Tracy and Jason Torchinsky. So it's, so it's not necessarily about, um, yeah, I forget the word you use. You said extreme. I said aggressive. Aggressive. It's not about being aggressive. It's about the elegant vertical integration, the reduction of brackets, and then notice all these lines travel in essentially one of the shortest paths possible. Then you have all your rubber portions to help for NVH all in one section. If you look at the Hyundai Ionic, which we can go take a look at, the thermal system is quite 
complicated. They have multiple PTC heaters and they have a condenser in the HVAC module. So it's almost like they have many of the components that are on the Tesla Model 3 and a Model Y. Now you mentioned that, you know, we mentioned that we do these teardowns. So this is an active project right now. We got this Hyundai Ionic 5 a couple months ago and it takes our, our company about two and a half to three months to complete a project from start to finish. And it's a very methodical process. So what we're doing is we're carefully disassembling. Is this whole space here yep, Hyundai? This whole space right here. So that's their battery yep. pit tray and mm -hmm. this is all their piece, bits the and pieces. And the level of detail that we go into is what's necessary to understand the cost. So this looks like the armrest. We need to disassemble the armrest to a state where we understand how these pieces of metal are bent and formed and welded, what type of plastic is there for support, is it over molded, so that we can accurately uh, do a cost analysis of a Hyundai Ionic 5. So uh, this is the wrong tag, but this is a rear armrest. And once we get down to the body in white, notice that our team is actually counting every single spot weld. So once again, you have a traditional body build here, similar to the uh, Mach-E. Notice the sim similarity in the designs with this mm -hmm. a piece of structure, slightly outboard to engage for what they call sorb. And um, we, we end up processing the entire vehicle in a similar manner. manner. You can see the drive units here. And we'll actually peel back uh, the shielding and the covering on these electric wires, these high voltage wires, so that we can better understand how they're built, what they cost. And how do you pick which car is next? Ooh, great, great, great question. So we interact with a lot of our clients and many of our clients will give us feedback. They say, hey, great, you just did the Model Y, but what are you doing next? And we pull them, we'll ask them. And uh, oftentimes they'll tell us, they'll say, we wanna see a Lyric, we wanna see a Hyundai Ionic, we wanna see this. We chose this because it's an Asian market vehicle that sells well in the United States that's 800 volts. Okay. So the fact that it's 800 volts was really intriguing to us because we wanted to have an 800 volt architecture in our study, in our comparison database. And uh, we considered some Chinese vehicles like the BYDs, but they're harder to get and more expensive to get. We could just buy this off of a dealership, snap of a finger, we had right. it in a few days. So some of its accessibility, cost of the vehicle, and then and BYD is still on your list. Yep. That will happen as soon as it makes sense. Yep. And BYD is growing in a very exciting and uh, noteworthy way, I believe. So that was part one. The rest of it will be out tomorrow morning. Uh, it'll be out a little earlier on Patreon. Uh, and uh, for that matter, if you'd like to become a member, uh, you can do that on YouTube or Patreon. And uh, my Twitter subscription membership thing will be enabled anytime now. Should be today or tomorrow. Who knows? I'll have different bonus content for each one. I don't know what to tell you. So uh, I do want to say a huge thanks to Corey and the team out at Monroe for letting us come in and take some up of their time. It was wonderful seeing them. They're great people. They do great work. Yes, you, you, you can buy a plaid report. I don't care if you own a car company or a battery company or a tech company or you're a bank or you're just a big fan, you can buy one. They're uh, priced, uh, priced attractively for what they are, considering you get millions of dollars worth of uh, stuff, uh, information that you can't get uh, without spending millions of dollars. So that's pretty exciting. So what did I miss? What did I misunderstand? Who knows? It might already be covered tomorrow, but we'll find out. Stay tuned, stay juicy, and I can't wait to hear from you clever robots on the next one tomorrow, I guess.